Hi, whether you're a first time YouTube guest or a long time member of our church, First Baptist Pulaski welcomes you. You know, our church family is messy. We are flawed. We have issues. We have sinned and fallen way short of what God desires and requires. But much of what motivates our worship is gratitude. See, God didn't leave us hopelessly wallowing around in the mud of our sin. No, He saw our need to be clean and sent His Son Jesus to take on human flesh, live the perfect life we could not, offer Himself on a cross as payment for our sins, and then rise victoriously from the dead. As Psalm 40 suggests, God lifted us up from the muck and mire, set our feet firmly on the rock of His Son, and put a new song of praise in our mouths. The truth is, we here at First Baptist Pulaski are imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We hope the encounter you are about to have with Him puts a new song of praise in your mouth as well. And if you find yourself in our neck of the woods anytime soon, we would love to have you come worship, grow, and serve with us in person. Thank you so much for joining us. Blessed is the man who believes in the trust in the Lord with confidence, his confidence is in him. He will be like a tree planted by the waters and sends out its roots by the stream. And it does not fear when the heat comes and its leaves are always green and it has uh, no worries in the year of droughts and it never fails to bear fruit. Then it happened, as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But, then Jesus, but when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable richness of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do.
This next song will be a little familiar, but it'll be a little different. It's before the throne of God above with a little bit of chorus thrown in. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea, a great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives and pleads for me. My name is graven on his hands, my name is Let us pray. Lord, blessed is your name. Um, you are marvelous, Lord. We just thank you for the blessings you have given us, Lord. They're too, too many to count. And Lord, we just ask your forgiveness um, and help us be quick in forgiving others. Lord, we thank you for the hope that you give us. Um, Lord, we just ask for strength, for physical strength, for spiritual strength, Lord. Um, just be with the missionaries that are out there, whether they're near or far. Um, just and be with the people that they are there to serve, Lord. We just, um, we just thank you for your grace, for your mercy, Lord. Um, and though we will never understand it, just the way that you love us, Lord. 
help us be um, humble people, Lord, and help us, help us understand your will and just not want to do ours. Lord, this blessing that, or this offering that we're about to, to take up, Lord, we just pray that it's used according to your will. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Not for a moment. There's something kind of powerful about that, that God is always with us. Before we, uh, we kind of get into our service and into the, the sermon part of this, I just wanted to, to let you know a couple things. Um, first is uh, some of you that are longtime uh, attenders and members here at uh, First Baptist, uh, you may remember Brother Bill Morse. Uh, I remember Brother Bill uh, only from a picture because he looks like Hoss Cartwright and he's right outside my office. That's what I'm constantly reminded of when I see his picture. But his wife, uh, Miss Dot, passed away uh, the end of this past week and uh, she actually had their, her funeral service is today at 3 o'clock at uh, Mount Zion uh, Baptist Church in uh, Huntsville, uh, Madison, that kind of stuff. If you are interested in going and are having questions about that. I had a few folks that asked uh, and just thought that you'd want to be aware of that as a church. So uh, if you have any questions about that, you can catch me right after service and I give you some more specific details. But just be in prayer for, for their family uh, as, uh, uh, as they uh, celebrate her life later this afternoon. Uh, also, just want to remind you that, uh, as you know, uh, hopefully you're continuing to pray uh, as, as we do for what God is doing through CB Outreach. Uh, and uh, Brother Tony, uh, who is in Oaxaca right now, just uh, wanted me to, to make sure that the church knew this. This uh, story we shared uh, this, this past week, that there was a couple, a family that had come in to, uh, to partake in uh, one of those meals. And they sat down, had a conversation with one of the local pastors that's a part of the board. And as they were talking, uh, they ended up uh, beginning to attend uh, this pastor's church. And as they began to attend the church, they came to faith and now have actually joined the church. Uh, and so there's something pretty exciting about how God is at work um, related to CB Outreach. And, uh, and so just continue to pray that, that we have those opportunities. And there's some things that constantly that, that we're learning better ways to engage with folks as they come through and, and to, to love on them and, and to talk. And I actually had a conversation with Barbara. Our, our Tuesday was this, this past week, and Miss Barbara was, was sharing. I think she shared with, with multiple of us about this, but uh, they had four people that sat and ate. Uh, this past week is what they, they typically, this past week there were a few, I, mean, I think 18 or 19 that sat down and ate, which gives us an opportunity to, to talk to more and more folks. Because a lot of folks will come and grab those, and they'll take them, take them home with them. And that, but there's more that are beginning to stay, and we're having some of those conversations. God is at work. Um, and as we... Think about God being at work. It's easy um, to fall into one of two categories. Uh, most people are wired in one of two ways. We're either wired that we see the glass half full, which means that when we hear things like that, we get excited. Then there are people like your associate pastor that, that tend to be a glass half empty person. Uh, detail oriented people tend to be glass half empty. Because we're always looking at what still needs to be done, and a lot of times don't stop long enough to go, it's incredible what God is doing. And if we're not careful, we miss those things. And um, as, as we said, it, it would have it been very, very easy for me to have been a Pharisee. It would have been way, way too easy for me to do that, because they were bean counters. They were real, they, they were real particular about, about certain things. So uh, uh, make particular... Um, there are other words that you could use that are not appropriate, so, um, because people have used them about me before. It's okay to laugh. So some of you are thinking that's, it's okay. Uh, I, I'm peculiar or, or you know, whatever words you want to. So um, I got to talking to somebody the other day and, and the question kind of came up, what are you going to do when you graduate? And I was around some, some high school students. What are you going to do when you graduate? Uh, and most of us remember being a kid or, or at that point where we're getting ready to graduate from high school, this kind of stuff. We all, I don't know if you, if you have a, a tendency to do this, but ever daydream. Um, or you just think about, you know, what do I want to be? What would I, what would I, what would I love to do? Um, I don't know if you ever get the opportunity on a Sunday night just to walk through where we do Awana or not. Um, but just about every other week they do a dress up night. This past week were superheroes and princesses. But anyway, there were superheroes and princesses. So I kept asking all these, you know, all these girls who were coming through all dressed up and stuff. I said, what are you? I said, what superhero? I'm a princess. The only princess is Princess Leia. We'll just leave it at that. So 
It's the only princess. No, I'm kidding. But daydream, you think about as a kid, what, what do we want to be when we grow up? What do we think about? Uh, maybe some of you are, are you know, sports oriented and you think about hitting the, a home run in, in the, the World Series. Um, you know, a superhero, you know, that I could fly, that I could, you know, leap, you know, a, a building, that I, you know, I'm super strong, whatever that might be, a princess, you know, with my subjects, whatever that, that looks like. Maybe you're a little more intellectual and, and this idea of would love to win a Nobel Prize or for most of us as we sing in our cars, win a Grammy. Um, we think about our Oscar, you know, maybe we think about we would love to have untold wealth so that we didn't have to worry about anything. We could be a blessing to other people, all of that kind of stuff. Or maybe you're a Tennessee fan and you would just like to win. <laughs> and you daydream about what that used to be like back when Fat Phil was our coach. You remember the good old days 900 years ago. If you're an Alabama fan, I'm laughing right now, so I'm praying for your soul. But anyway, um, I'm kidding. We think about this, and we, we don't. And part of us, when we think about it, when we're the glass half full person, we're thinking, I would love to do these things because look what we could accomplish together. When you're a bean counter sometimes, when you're the other side of that, you can look at it and you, and you end up kind of going, look what I could possibly get figured out. If I could just, if I could just, I could just. Sometimes if we're not careful, our eyes come off of what truly matters and we worry about what is it that I could accomplish and what I need and what I'm capable of doing. A lot of this even, we just want to be thought well of, that I am giving the best of who I am. There's not a single one of us in here that that's, that's not what we want. We don't want the person to our right or to our left, the people that we work with, to be a model employee, to be a great husband or father, uh, to, to be a great mom, a grandparent, whatever that is, to be an outstanding Sunday school teacher, a deacon, even if that's working with security, whatever that is, I, I want people to think that I'm doing a good job. That's part of it. We want somebody to brag on us. We want to have a reputation to where our voice matters. That's what we're after. For those of you that have been around a little bit like me, you remember in the, the, the 70s, maybe even in the 80s, that there was a, uh, a firm that is now defunct, which is kind of interesting, uh, E.F. Hutton. When E.F. Hutton speaks, what happens? People listen. Those commercials where two people would be talking, and all of a sudden they said, well, I, and E.F., and then everybody would stop and listen. I remember those growing up as a kid. It is kind of interesting that that, does, that firm doesn't exist anymore. They went bankrupt. Um, but as you start thinking about that's, I think sometimes that's what we want as human beings. We want our voice to matter. And then if we're not careful, we want our name to matter. Then after a while, we, if we're left unchecked, it gets to the point that we want what we want our way. And this is what becomes really, really difficult. Go ahead and turn to uh, Mark. Mark chapter 12. We're going to take a look at verses 38 through 44. There's a parallel to this that's actually in Luke chapter 21. Uh, we won't turn there, but uh, Mark chapter 12, verses 38 through 44 is where we're going to go. But I, I want to just kind of give you a little bit of a run-up to what's taking place here. If you back up to chapter 11, you have the triumphant entry. Jesus has entered into Jerusalem for the very last time. He's come in and immediately he runs right into the religious leaders and he starts having conversations with them. Very first thing that happens is when he gets to the temple, he cleans house. They have taken the temple and turned it into a place of sale and undercutting people and holding people hostage. You're, you're, here, to, you're here to worship here. I tell you what, I'm going to double check. It's the same thing that you experience when you go to any type of sporting event, uh, that a hot dog costs eight bucks. It's the same type principle. They were in there and they were taking advantage of people related to the worship of God and it did something to Jesus and he drove them out. Then he begins to have conversations with, with, with different groups. So, I don't want to bore you with a, with a long history lesson, but there were some groups among the, the Jews at that time, specifically the religious leaders. There were those that were referred to as Herodians. The Herodians were ones that uh, were connected to the rule of Herod, and they, there was a little bit of a hat tip uh, to 
being connected to Rome and that type of governmental authority and, and those type things. And so there were some issues that were there that were brought up related to render under Caesar that which is Caesar's is where he gives, he takes the coin and he makes this statement, you know, should we pay taxes? Should we not pay taxes? There was this struggle that was there. Then you also had the Sadducees that were floating around. The Sadducees, these were a group, they didn't even believe, they did not believe in an afterlife. They didn't believe in an eternity. They didn't believe in a resurrection, if you will. And so their idea that was there, and they had a conversation about if a man uh, is married to a woman and the brothers and this whole storyline, and if you don't remember all that, just back up the, the earlier in chapter 12 and you can see this. They don't even believe this. And again, it's just a trap for Jesus. And he unpacks it. He says, and he's driving to the point that we have got to be focused on my father. Then, of course, the scribes who, again, just like I said, would be, that, that would be where I might, you know, kind of slip into. When you start thinking about the, the scribes, which are part of the Pharisees, they were always worried about minute details. They were having conversations about what is the greatest commandment? What is the most important commandment? And again, what they're trying to do is, is it's the same thing that you see on television when you, whether it's political stuff or whether it's sports related or any of that kind of stuff, the questions that the media asks a lot of times are what? They can't be answered, but it, it creates story. If I can get somebody to say one thing or the other, if I can get them to say this or that, then, then I have a story and we can talk for three hours uh, about nothing. It's the same type thing. They're trying as much as they possibly can to trip Jesus up. And over and over and over, and each time he answers them to the point that they're like, okay, we're going to leave this guy alone for a moment. Because he kept answering with authority and was pulling apart the fallacies, the ridiculousness, what was, what was taking place there. Start wrestling as you kind of think through all of this, this stuff, even to the point that they start questioning son of David. What does that even mean? Then we get into verse 38, and Jesus makes some pretty powerful statements. I want you to listen to what he says. Beginning of verse 38, it says, In his teaching, Jesus, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplace and have the best seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses for a pretense and make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. Now, that's not one of those nice things that we were, I was talking to somebody just a minute ago about uh, some, some passages of Scripture and stuff, and there's things that as we read about and we understand who Jesus is and we understand about how God sees us, this kind of stuff, that we get reminded, as we have with some of the worship, that we, God is a big God. He is a powerful God. He's a caring God. He's a God that meets us where we are. He is a God that desires what is best for us. But at the same time, he is a jealous God. And he's a God that has a very specific desire for the way that we live and the way that we operate. And sometimes we get those things out of balance. I think about my relationship with my wife. When we think of the word jealousy, that's, that's an ugly word. No, it's not. Jealousy is not, I'm jealous for my wife's time. Just like she's jealous for my time. What does that mean? That means that she is desirous of spending time with me. Yes, I know she needs to have her head examined. She's desirous of spending time with me. This is part of God is jealous for us. His desire is to be in relationship with us. Not that he needs us, but because he loves us. And part of the problem is, is when we, our eyes come off of him and we make it about us, it changes the way that we go about worship. It changes the way that we go about living. It changes the way that we operate as his children. Because all of a sudden, it's about how people treat me, how people respond to me. Just listen to what it says here. And in his teaching, he said, Beware the scribes who like to walk along, walk around in long robes. Those long robes that they would wear, they identified them as somebody important. Oh, well, I see that. Now, if you were to walk into a hospital right now and you see somebody in a long white coat, who is that person? That's the doctor, right. So if that person comes in and starts talking to you about something that's going on with you, you're going to listen differently than somebody that comes in and scrubs. 
Are, are, am, I, am I being fair here in the way that we process things? Yes, that's the way we process things. It doesn't necessarily mean that that nurse doesn't know the same thing that the doctor does, but we give credence that it was the same thing. Don't you know who I am? And I'm not saying this about doctors. I'm saying this about the scribes. Look, I have this robe on. Do you not know who I am? You should, you should give me double honor. I am worthy of something special because of my long robe. It goes on and it says here, what, is it, what does it say? Walks around in long robes, likes greetings in the marketplace. We do this. This is a southern, you know, you had no idea that they were, they were southern in Jerusalem, did you? It's the same thing. We have those conversations with, oh, this is. And we, we process those things that way, do we not? Those places of honor, those greetings of honor. Well, hello. Well, hello. Well, I don't know what that's like. Y'all have to tell me. I don't ever get those conversations. So I'll try to go ahead. So what honor? What does that mean? We want that. We want people to know us. For those of you, again, that grew up in the 80s, there was something about, and actually there was in the 90s and early 2000s, there was a movement. There were all kinds of books that were written about the church having a little bit of that cheers mentality. When you walk in, everybody knows what? Everyone knows your name because people are significant. And folks, people are very important. When people walk through the doors of this building, when they come in, they need to, be, they need to feel welcome, but not at the expense of remembering who God is. We have to remember why we are here. And that's part of what they're getting at. They have forgotten. It's about me. Look at the robes. I want the greeting. I want to be considered important. It goes on and it says in verse 39, and they have the best seats in the synagogue. They had long benches that were there and those benches sat very close to where the scrolls were and those were reserved for special people. Oh, we can't sit there. That's where the robed people, the special greeting people, that's where they sit because that's, special and we don't tend to have that kind of stuff but we also have a little of that mentality is, is this is my space this is i'm important and if and left unchecked again we get to the an unhealthy place he goes on and it says what but also they want the the seat of honor at the feasts for southern baptists what is that the front of the line. That's it. That's it. It's the front of the line. That's where we, we, we kind of want to get to. We want to be considered, oh, no, why not? you need to go first. Oh, you need to go first. You need to go first. There's a little bit of that if we're not careful. And it says here, it goes on in verse 40, and it says, who devour widows' houses for a pretense. Now, there, just for, for those of you that, that take notes, there's, if you want to write this down, uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 through 4 uh, actually talks, Isaiah is talking very specifically about the issues that were going on even at that time with the way that widows were being handled and that it came down to, uh, if you really want to handle things the way that you need to, you give me, you need to contribute to what is happening at the temple. And so you need to contribute. And they would do that. And a lot of times what was taking place is they were robbing widows of what was left by their husbands for their livelihood with this pseudo spiritual, if you really love God, then this is what you will do. There was a caution even in Isaiah about that, and that's the same thing that was still taking place was, you know what, we really are in need of taking care. So you need to make sure that you, 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 need, to, you need to give over and abundant, and we're about to step into a little bit of a picture of this. Because there was something special about the way that giving took place. It goes on, and there's a question about why is it that Jesus is challenging them? You heard the passages that we read earlier. Those passages reminded us of who God is. When we remember who God is, then all of a sudden we begin to remember that it is God that does what is necessary. There's always going to be, in Southern Baptist churches, hero worship. There's always going to be. My Sunday school teacher, oh my goodness, he or she is so incredible. They just, they walk with God and they teach in a way. I, there's nobody that will ever be able to teach like they teach. There is not a single Sunday school teacher at this church that could not be replaced. Whoa. Okay, Rodney, now hang on. That's uncalled for. You don't know how. It, I will tell you right now, when I mentioned, and I don't mean this with any disrespect whatsoever, 
There are a lot of you in here that may remember Miss Dot, but there are many of you that have no idea who I'm talking about. Why? Because Miss Dot's been gone for a very long time from here. When I came on staff, I worked with Doug Plumley. I had way too many conversations with people. When God moved Doug, oh, we'll never have another pastor like Doug Plumley. I look at the litany or the, 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 the pictures of the men that have faithfully served as pastor here. Every single one of them can be replaced. You could fire every single one of us on staff. We could replace all of our deacons. We could do all of this because we are not the ones that are doing it. It's got to be God working through faithful people. 2 Timothy 2.2 2 says what? Take what you have learned from me in the presence of many witnesses and entrust it to who? To reliable men, to reliable individuals who will teach others. We simply have to be available. We've got to get past this idea that there's some sort of special something. I will tell you, leaving everybody aside, there is absolutely nothing special about me. There is nothing the only value that I have to the body here is when I am not Rodney and I am a yielded man before God. Because it all comes down to what he does, not what I do. There will come a day where all of us that are sitting in this room at the Lord Terry's will be a footnote. But hopefully, what will be not a footnote, hmm, who is God? He is the one that rescued me through his son, Jesus Christ. That is the message that matters. Not what we want. Not the way that we want it. Our value can't be, look at me. Look how special I am. Look what I have done. How I have contributed. The years that I have served. It can't be about that. It's got to be about who he is. I used to jokingly say this to my boys that uh, I could take them out and make another one look just like them. We've got to have that mentality, folks, about how we operate as God's people. We are His. Our value is in Him, not in what we bring. Listen to what it says, beginning in verse 41. And He, being Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. Now I want you to... In, Visualize this for a moment. You have the temple proper, but outside the temple, you have what's referred to as the court of women. In that court of women, there are these receptacles. And these receptacles were brass, and they would come up, and they looked like a trumpet. So if you think about a trumpet, and then it just had a, a, either a box, and they're not exactly sure whether it was just a shape. I will be honest with you. Some of you that are a little bit older may remember this. The pictures and the research that I did this past week and that kind of stuff, it looks like a spittoon to me. That's exactly what it looks like, is a spittoon. And what would happen, I want you to think about this. We don't, ha we don't have a tendency to use coins and paper money as much. We, we, we use digital stuff a lot. But if you've ever been sitting with a child that when they were little, you were helping them to understand what it was to give to the Lord and you gave them change and they thought that it would be really cool to hold the money up here as the plate goes by and drop it all and you hear cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. If you've ever heard that, it's the same thing. Only instead of being a child that wants to hear the noise, what you have here is, is Jesus is sitting opposite of one of these 13 trumpet-shaped offering boxes. And this is what happens. Many rich people put in large sums. So you want you to think about this for a second. If you've ever spilled a whole bunch of coins and that noise, but just imagine for a moment, you're sitting in that court of women and all of a sudden you hear copper coins, silver coins hitting this brass opening. Clang, 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 clang. What are you immediately going to do? You immediately, your eyes are going to be turned there. Why do you think that was such an issue? It's the same thing. Why do we do what we do? 
Do we do what we do so that people will pat us on the back? Or do we do what we do for the same reason that it appears that this widow does? Listen to what it says in verse 42. And a poor widow came and she put in two small copper coins, which make a penny. By the way, uh, a Daenerys um, was considered to be a day's wage at that time. What she put in was the equivalent of one sixty-fourth of a Daenerys. One sixty-four. Two small copper coins. For those of you that uh, are going to get the opportunity to go to the, to the Holy Land, when I was in Jerusalem, I actually bought two widow's mites. They're actually in my office. Uh, and it's really, really cool. Uh, one of them is actually slightly oxidized, and it's, it's got a little bit of that green on it from the copper. But you think about those two small coins... The noise and the racket of these large sums of money in these two small clinks. The clanging of all of that money up against the small clink of hers. Nobody's going to notice. Now there's some question here as you take a look at some things. and um, One of the things that's very, very clear is, is that Jesus was frustrated with these rich people. Not because they were giving. Why was he frustrated with them? was the way in which they were giving. Look at what I am capable of doing. Look what I can do. Look what I have done. Because now it's about whom? Me. Me. It's all about me. Look at me. Okay? I'm going to channel my inner Toby Keith for just a minute. Look at me. Let's talk about me. Let's look at me. It's all about me. Look what I'm capable of doing. And we forget the fact that Why is it that we are called to give? One of the things that I internalized as a kid that that was wrong was that a tenth of what I have belonged to the Lord. I was supposed to give my tithe. You know what the problem with thinking that a tenth belongs to the Lord is? We forget that the other 90 is His as well. We forget that it all belongs to Him. He is the one that has put breath in our lungs. He is the one that has created a purpose. He is the one that has shaped our lives and has laid it out before us. Everything we have is His. And what He's asked for is a portion back to remind us that it is His. It's so that we don't get to this point that we think, look what I have done. Look at what I am capable of doing. He goes on, and I love what he says here in verse 43. And he called his disciples to him, and he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, and she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she has. All she had to live on. Now there's a little bit of conversation about how some of this gets put together. There are some scholars that think that she gave because she had this great love for God. And she wanted to honor Him with all that she had and trust Him. I'm going to give all that I have. There are others that think that because of the structure within Jewish society at the time, that her being a widow, she was being pressured You need to give everything, sweetheart. If you really want God to bless you, if you really want us as the religious leaders to take care of you, you need to give everything. And so out of a false sense of religiosity, she dropped all of her coins in. Regardless, she is coming with reckless abandon. Whichever way it ends up, she's coming with reckless abandon. I'm giving it all. Do we think about it that way? Do we think about our time? Do we think about our resources? Do we think about our family? Do we think about what we want and how we want it? Do we worry about things that at the end of the day don't really matter? Do we wrestle there? Or is it so easy, as I find myself sometimes, is I've got 20 things that need to be done. And in getting all of those things done, I forget that the reason that we're doing what we're doing is to honor God. 
What we do for him can never, ever, ever be a job. Whether that's a nursery worker, whether that's part of our welcome team, whether that's one of us on staff, whether that's deacons, whatever that is, it cannot be about us. It's got to be about, God, what is it that you want to do with me? And I recklessly abandon everything to serve you so that my life has value to you. So that I understand that I can't do this. I'm not capable. I love listening to some of our deacons as they talk. Some, I, I don't know. I don't know if I can do that or not. If somebody will help me, I'll figure it out. That's the attitude of a servant. That's the attitude that we all have got to have. I don't know that I can do it, but I'm going to trust in God to help me to do it. Y'all just going to have to be patient with me as I'm figuring it out. And we're putting one foot in front of the other. And we're working and we're working and we're working and we're working. It's one of the things that I love about our D groups. When we first started doing those, there were folks that, as I would talk to them about, hey, look, would you be willing to help lead a group? Or would you be, I don't know that I can do that. I don't, I don't know. Well, you know what? We see that you are walking with the Lord. We see that you are, we, we see the things that are there. But I just don't know that I know enough about the Bible. We're not worried about how much you know about the Bible. What we're worried about is how much of the Bible you're living out. There's some of us that are like me that grew up in church. You knew stuff. You knew the trivia. You could, you could rattle stuff off. You knew all of that. But is it making its way into the way that we live? Scribes and Pharisees, they knew stuff up one side, down the other. They knew it all. But what were they living out? What was it that they were actually doing? How were they actually giving I want you to think about this just for a second many of you know that that I have the privilege of um, working as a chaplain uh, in the time that I, I've been here in Pulaski and over the last uh, this is our my fourth season with them working with uh, Richland High School uh, with their football team and, and it's one of my favorite parts of my week is, is to go on Thursdays and speak to those guys be on the sideline with them um, I am the uh, official get back coach, which means that I spend most of my time walking up and down the back up guys, back up guys. It's amazing how a bunch of high school athletes can't see a big white line on the ground. But anyway, um, I got tickled. One of the guys the other night looked at me and said, are you, it says, you're the get back coach. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, bud. I said, I am. And he says, yeah, I saw one of those guys in the NFL. It says, y'all's job's hard. So, uh, cause you are, you're trying to keep coaches and all this kind of stuff that, that, that are back. But it's one of my, one of my favorite things. And as we were getting ready to pray, to go out on the field, I don't know if I just have dismissed it, but if you look in the locker room, there are three beams that are across the top of the locker room, and there were three statements that were on there, and as I had the scripture rolling around the back of my head, as I had this widow that comes in, and she's dropping in her stuff, and as she is thinking about some of this stuff, and what Jesus is trying to drive home with his disciples, there's three statements just kind of came into focus for me, and obviously they're talking about winning football games, being a great team. The first statement that's up there is surrender the me for the we. I think we need to understand that as we have to surrender our me for the he. Not who we are, but who he is. Not about what we bring to the table. Not about how good I think I am, but how great he truly is. The second there, it says victory requires payment in advance. This past Thursday, as I was talking to the team, one of the things that we, that we talked about very specifically is, is that there's absolutely nothing ever given to you in life. You have to earn it all. You can't sit back and be entitled and just think somebody's going to hand something to you. There is absolutely nothing, on, nothing in life that is ever given freely. I said, even salvation God gives it to us, but the payment was made in advance. Who paid for it? Who earned it? The Son of God. That's who earned it. Even though it was given to us, it was still earned by Him. Nothing. Victory requires payment in advance. We are who we are because of who we are in Christ. We have to lay down our lives and we have to take up His to walk in Him. 
The last statement is, and this is the part that I, I, I was probably most blown away by. How do you want to be remembered? How do you want to be remembered? I don't want this to sound harsh at all. Do we want to be remembered as somebody's name that was put in a Bible? Do we want to be remembered as somebody's name that was put on a plaque somewhere in a building? Do we want to be remembered as someone who was inducted into some organization as a special person? Or do we want to be remembered not by name, but by reputation in Christ? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters, folks. We don't have a name for any of these scribes. We don't have a name for any of these Pharisees. We don't have any, a name for the widow. None of that is given to us in this passage. What we are reminded of is who? Who God is and who the Son is and what He was calling to us as His disciples to walk. Are we going to operate that way? Or are we going to look, I want to make my name known. I want to be seen as valuable. When you uh, give an invitation after talking about stuff like this, nobody wants to come up. One of the things that you've heard Brother Tony talk about over the last few weeks is the value of prayer. Part of the reason that we're terrified sometimes about coming up here is because we're worried about what other people are going to think. Well, what's going on with them? Well, is, their, is their marriage falling apart? Or, well, I guess they're probably you know, looking at inappropriate things on the Internet. Well, I guess maybe they're, they're not giving to the church like they need to. Or maybe they're not. Who gives a rip? We as God's people have got to stop worrying about what each other thinks and start caring more about getting our lives right before God. Because when I stand before the Lord, what you say about me, good, bad, or ugly, is not going to matter. All that's going to matter is who He says that I am. And when my life is laid bare, there's going to be moments that I'm going to grieve because I was Rodney instead of His child. Don't let other people, scribes and Pharisees in your life, don't let those of us at times that get things out of whack, rob you of a moment where you need to simply come and just pray because you have a burden for someone that you work with that doesn't know Him. Or maybe you have a burden for a couple that's going through a difficult time. Maybe you have a burden for your family. Maybe you have a burden for a child. Maybe you have a burden for whatever it is, but we come and we simply rest praying. By the way, there's nothing special about the carpet that's up here. There's nothing special. You, there's not like a, you don't go through a barrier of holiness or any of that kind of stuff. We get to come because of who he is. I can't ask anything. I can't do anything. We already talked about that apart from what he does. I'm going to ask those that are going to be leading us in, in our, our song to do that. We're going to take a moment. We're going to pray. As we pray, I'm going to ask, as soon as I say amen, we're going to stand. We're going to sing. There'll be some of us that'll be here to pray with you if you need us. But if you just want to come and you just want to spend time, you just want to bow. By the way, I know sometimes it's difficult when you're in the balcony to get all the way down here. We're not in any kind of a rush. If you need to just step out in the aisle and kneel where you are, we have to hold on to the fact that He is who we say. He, so we are who He says that we are. And that we can do nothing apart from Him. We bring nothing with us into this world. And when we leave, we take nothing with us. All we have is the redemptive work of God through Jesus Christ. And what that means is it echoes in eternity. Father, help us. Help us to have a vision for what You want us to do. Help us to not... Look for those places of honor to where we want to be bragged on and we want to be looked to and we want our voice to matter. Help us to always serve in a way, whether that is out of the abundance of what you've blessed us with, whether it is out of our human poverty or even our spiritual poverty that we are, we're giving what we have, not looking to give what somebody else has, but what we have. 
Father, this is not about being rich or poor. This is not about being smart. Uh, Father, this is not about being talented. This is not about anything other than using all of that for your glory. Humbly trusting in you. So, Father, right now, help us to listen for your voice and respond as your Holy Spirit draws us to the truth of your word so that as we leave, we're prepared to walk in it. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come into your courts and pray. Lord, to make known our desires. Lord, but we come hoping that our hearts would be turned toward you in a way that is so powerful, Lord, that we're willing to give our everything. Lord, that it's not just about a show, but instead it's about who you are and showing off who you are in our lives. Lord, help us to live that way for your great name. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We're going to sing the first verse, and there's a little bit of a chorus added to the end. 